never, you're the best until you're not. And this is what I want to share with you today. It's talking about you going throughout your life and staying your best and becoming better each and every day. Now, we're here at the Marriott School. It's a great um, honor to be here for me, um, especially as one who didn't come to the Marriott School as an undergrad. I came to BYU. I studied geography. I happen to like to travel, so I thought that would be a great thing to study. Turns out that's not a great way to earn a living, just in case anybody was wondering. Um, you're not going to make a lot of money coming out of the geography department. For me, um, however, I, I started a business early on, just right out of BYU. Went, well, I worked first for a company that was publicly traded, um, had perhaps the worst boss anybody could imagine. There, there could be movies made about how bad this boss was. But it was the best thing that ever happened to me because it sort of moved me into a place where I had to find work for myself. I had left that company and started this, this business. Um, in doing so, um, I learned how inept I was actually at business, how terrible I was at accounting. I didn't know a thing about finance, so many things that I didn't know. And so it forced me into a place where I had to start studying, either hire the right people, which is a good thing to do anyway, or go back to school which I did, and so I went back to school, went, uh, decided to go back to grad school out east, a little school called Harvard you may have heard of. Um, I was lucky to kind of kick the back door in and, and, and able to get into a good business school. After that, went to um, Oxford after I had, was ready to sell my business. So, we, so kind of by virtue of good, good luck, was able to go to some okay business schools and, and learn a few things about business that helped me now do what we do at Clark Capital Partners. Uh, I will say first and foremost, as we're talking about business and, and building one's business, I was really lucky. Um, you wouldn't think that because I started our first business, ClearLink, six weeks after 9-11, okay? So the dot-com bubble had burst. Um, nobody believed in the internet any longer. Right? Um, there was no money to be raised, so I couldn't find capital to be invested in my business at that time. But what it did is it cleared out the competitive landscape for us. And so we knew of other businesses that were doing what we were attempting to do that were doing very, very well. Because, and then we were able to do even better because that competitive landscape had been comple completely decimated with those that had taken on capital or debt or other things like that, so equity or debt. Um, but that's, that's sort of the story of how ClearLink came about. But it was a, it was a trial and error for us. Um, and, and I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the errors. But before I do that, I um, just want to talk a little bit about some examples of those that were really great, much like you, and the great careers that you have ahead of you, who were the best at their craft until they were not. So let me give you some examples here, making sure that the clicker is working. OK, so this is an individual. Wall Turns out, this guy becomes a Wall Street legend. But he started his firm in 1960. For 50 years, he had the best of breed firm. He, he ended up being, becoming a chair of one of the exchanges. Legendary for his 10 to 18% returns. His curve of yield and distribution was like this. Um, was wonderful. Uh, a legend came out of Hofstra that used to be a, an NYU um, divi division of NYU and then kind of spun out on its own, but came out of Hofstra University and built this great career over 50 years. Anybody recognize this building? It's in New York. It's on Third Avenue. It's known as the Lipstick Building. It's famous um, for being the headquarters to this individual and his firm. So when you're in New York, watch for the, the Lipstick Building. In 2000, 40 years after he started his firm, he has tens of billions of dollars under management. Okay? He pioneers this great split strike conversion, which is actually something really innovative, or was at the time, before electronic trading and all kinds of things like that. Handled 9%. Can you imagine handling 9% of all the New York Stock Exchange's trades? Again, legendary status. And then someone digs a little deeper into his firm 40 years later and finds out that, that there's something wrong that below this very beautiful veneer that had been built, that there's no way that a firm could straight line the way that it had for all those years, because doing so would be equivalent to someone in baseball hitting a 925. Anybody know what it takes to get into the Hall of Fame? What batting average? About? Yeah, about a 300. 400 is off the charts, and some people do it from year to year, but 300 average over a lifetime. So this is like him hitting a 925. So they dig deeper. 
and deeper. Do you think somebody's doing something illegal there, they ask. So we, we will call him Lawrence for our purposes. At this point, in 2007, 47 years into his career, he has over $80 billion under management, okay? And a year later, he was out of business. Why? Do you know who this guy is? Any guesses? Bernie Madoff. Bridger, there you are. Extra bonus points for Bridger right over here. Bernie Madoff, largest Ponzi scheme of all time. Lost $65 billion worth of clients' money in his process. Liable for tens of billions of dollars himself. 150-year prison sentence. I, I don't think he's going to live to serve that one. No chance of parole. Where should I point this so it goes? Multiple suicides in his firm, including both of his sons passing away, one from cancer, the other one took his own life. They were both at the firm and actually took the fall for a lot of things that took place, but countless careers and lives ruined through this process. This is Bernard Madoff. He was the best and the best of class until he was not. Another one. Now, this is a sad one for me to share because this is someone I actually really, really admire. And, and I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about Frank Sinatra on the right there, okay? I like Frank Sinatra, but I'm talking about this man on the left. Anybody know who that is? You should be able to tell this one. This is Steve Wynn. Ever heard of Steve Wynn or what he does? Okay, a, a hotelier and, and a casino owner. Not that, it, listen, we're here at BYU, and I'm not here to tell you how great owning a casino is, okay? Uh, but this is someone that I really admire, and I'll tell you why. Because if you've ever stayed at the Wynn Hotels, and they're about as nice a hotel as there is, um, you'll, you'll, pull, you know, you'll pull up, and they'll open the door. You'll try to open it for yourself, and they will say, oh, no, 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 no. Mr. Wynn wouldn't let me let you open your own door. You go to get your own bags. Oh, no. Mr. Wynn wouldn't let me have you get your own bags. And on and on. You can see how that goes. So for us, it was inspiring as we started our own firm. And that's part of the reason we didn't put some other name on our firm. We put our own name, much like a Mr. Wynn um, put his name on his own firm because it, the buck stops with him. And the culture started with him. So we thought that was really powerful. That's part of the reason, again, why we put our own name and hung our, our, our shingle out there is to you know, make sure that the, the culture started with me and with our family and the buck ended with me. So I would be responsible. And that's part of the reason why we did that. Sadly, turns out, he again was another one where he was the best until he was not. But he graduates from the University of Pennsylvania. He's, he's also accepted to Yale Law School. Um, for him, had a series of uh, unfortunate events that kind of led him to his career. His father passed away right as he was entering Yale. He was going to go to law school after going to the University of Pennsylvania, and his father left his family with about $350,000 worth of gambling debts. So you can imagine sort of in the 60s what that would mean to somebody. $350,000, multiply that several times, and that's the equivalent of what you would have to pay off today. That's what took place and spur you know, spurred on his career become this casino magnate. But these are the beautiful hotels in Las Vegas. And the architecture is wonderful and it's inspiring. Again, not here to endorse casinos. Please don't go to this casino just because I'm saying it's beautiful, OK? Are you nodding? OK. We know where we are here, OK? But I'm, I'm talking about his business model and the things that he does, OK, or had done. But he became a billionaire, multi-billionaire, multi by building his own wind casinos in, La in Las Vegas. And then Macau in China, the island off of Mainland China there, close to Hong Kong, okay? However, for him, in 2019, February, he, he is uh, served with uh, all kinds of lawsuits about his sexual misconduct, a la the Me Too uh, movement, and suddenly he finds himself, after 50 years without a job, at age 50, at 75, one of the greatest in his own field um, is fired amidst scandal. Again, one of these greats that was the best there was, at least to us on the outside, until he was not, right? Remember this. You're the best until you're not. You're not. Remember that, please. Okay, these, these are examples right here of some companies that were established 1995 to 2000, about the time when the, this dot-com bubble burst that I was talking about. Anybody recognize any of these companies? You can see in the middle the logo is there, so that is the company. Easy answer, right? In the middle, that's Webvan. First one, pets.com. Okay, second one, Webvan. 
And then eToys, okay, all had these multi-billion dollar valuations. Okay, what did they actually do? They just wanted to sell toys. They thought if they bought a domain, eToys.com, that was worth a billion dollars. And guess what? The market said it was as well, but they didn't perform. Webband, same thing. Pets, and I'm in that space. I love that space. Would love to have that URL at pets.com. However, because they didn't perform, each, each of these with a multi-billion dollar valuation were out of business within months of their IPOs. It, it is as if, and we see this a little bit sometimes today in the age of the unicorn. Anybody know a little bit about the, uh, um, the tale of the emperor um, without any clothes? You know this? Okay, who can tell us a little bit about that story, Joseph? So there was an emperor who um, he had the two people that came to him, two, two men that basically said, um, we, can, we can spin you the clothes out of the finest, finest cloth, basically, um, and, and, and you're going to pay us this much. So they go, and they spin him these clothes, and he's not wearing anything. He said, you know, and, and, they, and they look at him, and they say, oh, you look so amazing. You look, your clothes are beautiful. And that's how this works. Thank you, Joseph, very, very much. Well said. Round of applause for Joseph. Thank you, by the way. Thank you. Folks, I'm talking about real revenue and real profit. Because in the age of the unicorn, there are many that will be rewarded, OK, for getting through to the next company that can support a company that is losing money. But in the real world where I work, outside of, hey, we're going to place these great big bets and close our eyes and write a check and hope that this works out, where we're focused on real companies with real revenues and real earnings, a domain, a four-letter domain is not going to be worth a billion dollars. A company that is losing many millions of dollars on a monthly basis that has no path to profitability is not sustainable. And this is, this is a, an example of what we might be seeing in the market right now that makes it ripe for a correction. And for every one of those great companies that you, know, that you hear about, and you hear about these multi-billion dollar exits, even here in our own community, and I applaud them all, and I root for all of them, and we want them to be successful, there is a fair amount of this tale of the emperor's clothes, that it is story-driven. We're seeing a little, bit about, uh, a little bit of that with WeWork. Who can tell us what's going on with WeWork right now? We're pretty close to that, and a friend of ours that's taken over this, this role as CEO from SoftBank. Um, if you've watched, this is a company with a then deca billion dollar valuation run by what they called many times, and I'm, not, I'm trying not to disparage, but they called him this, this crazy CEO. So he's being congratulated for being a, a, a crazy CEO, deca billion dollar valuation, and they are within days and weeks of being bankrupt. Thankfully for them, the, the story continues, and they've got some great leadership that's come in, new cash infusion, other things like that. But that is a perfect example of what we would talk about as we're talking about the emperor's clothes. There are comps to that. Regis is a great you know, office space operator, much like those guys, that has about a billion dollar plus valuation. They have $35 billion of debt or so, just so that, so that we're aware of this. Other companies here close by have gone public after raising multi-billion dollar valuations, they, they, go, they then go public at a several hundred million dollar valuation at a 15 to one reverse split. That's, that's not favorable, guys. And we're rooting for these companies. But there's got to be a there, there. There's got to be something behind it. And I do believe in the products of a lot of these companies that we're talking about and the people that are there. They're wonderful. And like I said, we're rooting for all of them. But it can't be a tale of a unicorn or then a unicorn on fire, OK? And that's what some people are predicting. You know, put your helmets on for these unicorns. It's great to get that kind of valuation. But I promise you that the investors that allocate their dollars into these businesses will get their money back. And you know, finders keeper or buyers keepers, founders weepers. 
is what a lot of people will say in a situation like that. So, so watch for that, but know that you're looking for solid fundamentals, even in an age of a time when you see things that, are, that have so much sexiness, and I'm sorry to say that too, but it's just so appealing to look at something that has XYZ valuation or beautiful office space, um, you want to look at the fundamentals. And this is what you're learning here at Brigham Young University and here at the Marriott School, the fundamentals of what business is about because they, we, all of us are the best until we're not, okay? Um, some best in class companies, Enron. Anybody know the story of Enron? We've had the whistleblower of Enron stand right here on this stage, okay? $66 billion to zero. Arthur Anderson, know this one? Okay. They were the accounting firm for Enron. Of course, if you're accounting something and you're saying it's not fraudulent and it turns out it is, you're going to go away as well. And their 85,000 employees did also. Okay, WorldCom, this is a, was the biggest of its day, $104 billion to zero. All fraudulent based behavior. And the granddaddy of them all, $640 billion to zero. Any guesses as to what this one is? Say it louder. Any guesses? Lehman? Yeah, exactly. Well said. Yep. Well done. So again, best in class companies. And they were highly revered. Emperor's close examples. Okay. You're the best until you're not. I'm not going to show you this video. We'll skip right through it. But these are some of our investments to date. And we're reminded for ourselves that we have to every day make that commitment to be our very best. Because you can work a lifetime. And this is what... You know, Warren Buffett said when, when he was brought in under, you know, congressional hearing to talk about um, the old Bear, Bear Stearns that predated the Lehman scandal. He was an investor. He took over the board as chair and said to them, you, know, you can, essentially, and I'm paraphrase, paraphrasing what he says, you can lose money, but if you lose an ounce of my, uh, your own integrity in this process or reputation, it's over. It's over for you and it's over for me and I'll, I, I won't back behavior like this. So I want you to know that, that this is, these are things that we take seriously um, as it relates to integrity on a daily basis and building just the best kinds of businesses we can. But we're, we're not immune to this either, nor are our operators, our CEOs, our employees. We've got about 35,000 employees amidst our portfolio companies today. We are not immune to this. We have our own challenges that we deal with on a daily basis. And so we, we remind ourselves to be the very, very best we can and not be thrown in that category of, of uh, a not the very best. We're in the situations of, of scandal, as it were, as we're looking at. Sorry, I'm still going here. Bridger, am I clicking this okay? So here's some, some quick warnings. And I want to go to Q&A because those are, hopefully, I, I, this is the opportunity where you get to ask what you really want to know, okay? Uh, but we'll just go through this. Warning, here you go, entitleitis, everyone. Anybody know what that is? We talk about that a lot in our firm, entitleitis. What do you think that means? Who's the brave one that's gonna raise their hands? Raise their hand, okay, please. Yeah. Can you hear, can everybody hear what he's saying? Say it good and loud, that's a good answer. Feeling entitled that you deserve something that you really don't deserve, right? You feel like that. What do you deserve? You as students of Brigham Young University, quality education that you're paying for. Do you deserve the highest paying job when you get out of here? We earn it, right? You earn it. It's that entitleitis. Steer clear of that, that entitlement, that feeling. And we, we say entitleitis because it is a disease and it can spread amidst an organization. People believe that they're entitled to higher pay when it's not perhaps warranted or earned. They they're, feel like they're deserving of a, uh, a promotion that hasn't been earned. Uh, des deserving of the best job coming out of your undergrad. No, these are things that are earned, not given. Okay? Two. Getting in and graduating, and I, I really want to focus on this one, getting into BYU and graduating from BYU must not be the most important accomplishment of your life. I'm even quoting scripture on this one, okay? In 2 Nephi 9.28, when it reads, when they are learned, they think they are wise. I had a religion professor here at BYU who used to say that, as he defined wisdom, he said, wisdom is the wise use of knowledge. It's not just having that, it's the wise use of knowledge. Because they are learned, they think they are wise. Okay? It is the wise use of knowledge. 
And that's and, and, and certainly talking about the pride of individuals and thinking that they're smarter than perhaps they actually are. This cannot be the best thing you ever do. This must be the springboard to your life. You've gotten into a great university. You will have accomplished much and great things up to that point in your life, but it's got to be the springboard. Being here at BYU may get you your first job out of school, but it's not going to get you the next one. Your reputation, your, your last name, and who you are, plus this university, are what are going to get you those next jobs. Because you've done. Because you go to execute. Because, like we say in our firm, you went there to dig ditch. And I'm an Idaho farm kid. I love to dig ditch, right? Not really. I don't. But in business, it's a lot easier to do that, okay? But you've got to go and execute. Um, Dreamers and ideas are a dime a dozen. It's those who have those ideas and can execute, can go out and dig ditch and do the hard things that will really make a splash in their own career and be wonderful. Three, and I've already touched on this one a little bit, your name plus BYU is your most valuable asset. If you tarnish that last name of yours, you are then tarnishing this university and I need you to, to understand the full weight of what that means, okay? And I know that I'm saying a lot of things, and this is this, I hope it doesn't feel like I'm castigating you somehow, that this is some chastisement of sorts, because it's not. It's a warning. It's a warning to, to you, my fellow BYU alumni, to, to make this that springboard, to leverage your own name. When you introduce yourselves, don't just say, hey, I'm James, or hey, I'm Savannah, or I'm Ane. Listen, I'm James Clark. You know, I, I'm Scott Peterson. Use that last name. It is your greatest asset. As I was talking about each one of these, these individuals, um, Bernie Madoff, Steve Wynn, you notice that I associated with them where they went to university, right? You'll forever be tied to this university, and, and it's your duty to make sure that you honor that as it will honor you and bless your life. Um, let, let me now just share this last little bit. This is the last slide. Is it okay if we go into Q&A? Okay. Okay. Um, what? Because we want to make sure that there's plenty of time for that. Um, I don't know if there are any Latin speakers in here, but you can probably get the, the meaning of this one. This is. Uh, it reads "Labore et honore." Okay. Listen to a lot of Latin while I was at Oxford. Didn't understand very much of it, but listen to a lot of it. Our, our graduation, matriculation ceremonies, all all in Latin. This is our family crest. Uh, for the Clark family. I grew up in a home where this family crest was framed on our wall. And every morning I would come to the top of the stairs and see this crest thinking, what in the world is labore et honore? When I turned 12, um, that changed because I started working for my parents. I start, started working on a farm. I also worked for our family. And, and every week my dad uh, would write a check to me. Okay, And I, I, I was making maybe 15 Hour, or $15 a week, about $1.33 an hour working sort of part-time for him um, through the summers, and then I had other jobs and things, moving pipe and so forth. At the end of that week, when I would get my $15 to $20 check, in the little memo section, if I had done a good job, if I had done everything that was expected of me, if I had been honorable, right, and, and been on time, finished everything that was intended for me to finish, it would read, labor and honor, the meaning of this labore et honore. However, if I had not done what I was supposed to do, if I had been late or been slow or not finished what I was supposed to do, um, they're working for him, it would simply read labor. Yeah, it hurt. It hurt this little boy in a meaningful way for me to understand that labor without honor would never be satisfactory to me in my life. That it was about doing things that had meaning. Anybody can work, but to work honorably is special. So many of you have done that to get here to this university, to get into the programs that you're getting into here at the Marriott School. My charge to each one of you is that you might have labor and honor throughout your lives. And as you do that, your lives will be blessed and you will find success beyond, beyond your wildest imagination. And with that, I open to questions. Okay. So you mentioned that you uh, graduated in geography and kind of moved on to other big universities. What was the first business that you started and how was it, like, what was it? So it, even before my uh, ClearLink days, I started a company called iSatellite, and we were selling satellite dishes door to door. I had started selling in the summer of 1994 for a friend of mine that had served in the same mission in the Dominican Republic where I had served. 
And he had built this company, and I went to work for him uh, selling pest control door to door and thought, oh, this, this is a great thing, but if he can do that, I can start my own business. Turns out he went out of business that summer. It was called Creative Marketing Concepts. I know that he was doing a lot of good skiing behind the brand new ski boat he had bought. Um, maybe not tending to his business, but he changed that the next year, reopened up a business then that was called uh, Vivint. You might have heard of that one. So he's done okay. That's a great guy. That's Todd Peterson, and he's done a wonderful job. So I, as a favor to me after his business went out, um, he let me start my own business right inside the walls of his business. And guys like, you ever heard of, you probably had Ryan Smith here speaking. So Ryan Smith of Qualtrics was there in that same office building with us. Um, guys like Sean Clark from MX, um, several, several others that were around at that time. So a lot of, it was very entrepreneurial. It was, he was a great uh, harvester of talent, Todd Peterson. So I owe him a lot. He's done great things. So just to build off of that, how would you recommend us, like following the steps, like what would you recommend us to do? So that was something that I knew, right? So I had knocked on doors and did that for several summers before I started my own business of bringing in guys to knock on doors for me, okay? My next business, Clearlink, was something that I knew nothing about. I had these relationships with all these services to the home providers, with Terminex and Dish Network and DirecTV, and that's what we were selling with Clearlink to start before we moved into several other brands. So I had those relationships, but I did not know technology. I had to learn technology the same way that I had to go back to school to learn finance and accounting and several other things when I went back to grad school. So, yeah. So do what you know. Do what you're passionate about, but do what you know, and that's a good way to start. So you've got to, you're expected to be the expert in that. So great question. Thank you. Other questions? This side of the room, maybe? Oh, Sam. I know Sam. Great prayer, by the way. Thank you. I, I needed that. Oh, there have been a lot of failures. Let me tell you that first, you guys. It's easy to, for, to sit here and say how, you know, we, we've done this or that or had these companies. Uh, we've had a lot of failures. And for, one for me was that we thought we were going to sell Clearlink in 2008. So it was, you know, that would have been pretty quick. End of 2001, sell in 2008. I thought I would play this serial entrepreneur role. And we went out to sell that business. And as you know, in 2008... The world fell apart financially. So all the offers that we had, they're waiting for us. And I was already calculating and spending money in my head and what I should do with that. Um, turns out I, 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 even, I didn't even have a job after that because I had turned over the reins of this company to the CEO of one of the portfolio companies we had acquired. So I was out of a job. Not only did we not sell our company, I didn't have a job. So I had to go figure out what I would do for the next sort of stage of my life. Um, turns out, what we learned there, Sam, was that was the, one of the greatest gifts I had ever gotten. I set up an office in New York City, um, was commuting there back and forth every other week, and that's when we formulated what we would do at Clark Capital. So, two years later, when we sold the business, at the very beginning of 2011, um, we not only had our business grown at Clearlink several folds, so it was a great blessing to us, but um, I also had figured out what we would do as an investment firm, allocating to growth equity and private equity and investing in other businesses. So it became a great blessing to us. This, you know, this very painful 2008 was the best thing that ever happened to us. And we immediately, the same week that we sold Clearlink, began allocating capital to other businesses. So, please, tell us your name so everybody knows who's asking the question. Drew, good and loud, thanks. Yeah, um, You're going to say your last name, remember that? Carson. Thank you, Drew Carson. Um, so it really pulled my attention that Scott described you as a kind person. Oh. I'm curious about, we don't really hear that word associated with a lot of very successful people. What challenges and pressures did you face that would um, tempt you to compromise those values? And yeah. how can we prepare to face those challenges? And pressures? Okay, great question, Drew. Thank you very much. Um, the question is, if you didn't hear that, is talking about kindness and something that you don't often hear as it pertains to an entrepreneur uh, or somebody who does what I do or a, as an investor. We're, investors are generally known as table thumpers, right? And, and occasionally we you know, do need to thump a table or two, 
But we try to be that softer side uh, of, of an investor's mindset. I think what we say in our firm is, just because we're easygoing doesn't mean that we're easy. We expect greatness out of our entrepreneurs and out of our portfolio companies, um, but we're easygoing as, as human beings, and, and we hope that, that that serves us well. I, I remember having an employee come to my, into my office, and, and this was a senior leader of one of our organizations, saying to me, James, I need you to yell at me. I will perform better if you yell at me. Can you imagine? What would you do? This person is asking me to do that. And I thought about it for a minute. It was really tempting because I was not very happy. Um, but I simply said, I, I can't change who I am, even in a situation where it might help you. And listen, again, this is not us saying that we're somehow better than anybody else in what we do. But we do try to um, be a softer touch in, in what we do. But we're serious about our efforts, and we're serious about our businesses. And we, we just try to think about families first. We think we are a family office, which means essentially we're managing our own capital uh, in, in most of what we do and most of the allocations that we do. But um, yeah, and, and I think that's what helps us, um, you know, perhaps differentiate ourselves. You see this little Clark E on the end there, that's our asymmetry. Um, not all Clarks are spelled that way and not all firms are built the way our firm is. And, and I, th I think it's, that's the asymmetry that we, we try to show. So um, in my scripture study this morning, hmm. I was reading from Jacob chapter 2, and it noticed, it, uh, it says this, um, and the hand of providence has smiled upon you most pleasingly that you have obtained many riches, and because some of you have obtained more abundantly than that of your brethren, you are lifted up in the pride of your hearts and wear stiff necks and high heads because of the costliness of your apparel and persecute your brethren because ye suppose that ye are better than they. So that's the thing, the real question that you're asking and the truth is that James and I both know is that we, none of us, are better than anyone else. But this is what I admire about James is it's not something that he just talks about uh, or even has to talk about, people observe it in his behavior that they know that he doesn't deem himself better than anyone else. And we don't need to either, any of us. You can go out throughout your whole lives and remember that God views each one of us the same. He loves each one of us. Yeah, thank you, brother. Thank you. It's fantastic, Scott. Appreciate you sharing that. Can I just share one more thing, and then we'll go to this question right here. Um, it makes me think about, um, well, let's, let's go to the question. We'll come back to this. Great question there. Thank you. Okay, so it's a wonderful question. It's asking about, you're asking about balance. And tell us your name. Jackson Jr. Jackson Jr. Thank you very much. How do I balance my time? For a long time, I tried to accomplish balance. Uh, then I sort of shifted. I remember listening to um, Meg Whitman. This is probably 2008. It was her last day at eBay. She happened to be in the state of Utah uh, talking to some entrepreneurs here in the state. And as she did that, she talked about how she believed in trade-offs, um, you know, trading something of lesser value for something of greater value. The problem with that is when you say, oh, kids, I, I've got to go do this because, you know, this, I've got to go meet with this business person. What are you telling your kids? That they're of lesser value so you can go do whatever it is of greater value. I, you know, I really like what Scott Peterson has taught me, and he's taught me so many things, but it is he sees it more as harmony. That your, your life and what you do on a daily basis is that melody. And you're adding harmony with all the little bits and pieces that you get to add in. So you've got your core, what you do with your family and with, your, with those that are most important to you and, and your relationship with your Heavenly Father. And then you've got those bits and pieces that are the harmony, which are always going to be secondary to those familial and, and, and celestial relationships. What takes place in my business is always going to find a second or third tier seat. But that's, that's the way we manage because that's what we've chosen to do and what we've chosen to be. But we still spend a lot of time at work, more waking hours than I do with my wife, with those people that I, I, I'm, I'm associated at my business. So 
that's the best way that I can describe what we try to do. And it's, it's a daily attempt. And sometimes we don't achieve it. And sometimes we do. But we, we really strive for that. Great question. Others? Yes, please. And your name is? Um, Jessica Thank you, Jessica. What are the most important things you learned that you still want to do? Oh, you know, I, I didn't learn very much at all. <laughs> no, I learned a lot. But let me just tell you, the, the thing that I appreciate the most, if I can answer this a different way, is uh, I, I appreciate most the relationships that I built. Um, you're with like-minded people that are trying to accomplish essentially the same thing that you're trying to do, to better yourself, understand more about how to run and operate businesses. And you become very, very close with those individuals. And you'll experience that to some degree, I think, during your undergraduate education. But to do that on a graduate level, especially at very competitive universities, um, you find a new intensity to that relationship that I was not expecting. And that, to me, that was the best part of that. And many of those have become business partners or co-investors and at least very, very dear friends and confidants that I can trust. Um, so yeah, learn the things that you had imagined that you would learn, okay? Learned a lot of new terminology where I can jargon people out of discussions and you know, they might not understand what I'm talking about. I don't want to do that. I don't like to do that. But I, I, I love the friendships that, that we built there. I know that's not exactly what you wanted to know, but that is the best thing about business school for me. Please, right here. My name is Weston Clark. Thanks, Weston. With an E or no E? No E. Oh, that's good. We like you. <laughs> what do you look for in entrepreneurs or people with ideas for you? Um, honesty. Okay, uh, hard work, um, and then whether this business is viable or not. Notice how I said that. I have a, a dear friend and a mentor that says to me that the, the three reasons you do business with someone is because first, you like them. This, is, this guy's a legend at Goldman Sachs, by the way. Was, now he manages his own $8 billion book. Because they will, they will allocate to you because they like you, they trust you, and then third, and last important, they will make you money, or you will be successful in whatever it is. So those kinds of things. Thanks. Right here in the middle, and then we'll go right back to you. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm True Fulmer. Um, Hi, True. talked about how we should have our business be kind of easy to do. Oh, I'm a graduate from JMU, and you've had a lot of achievements in your life. For you personally, what's your best achievement? What's the achievement that's most important to you? Savvy, can you stand up? This is my daughter, Savannah, that's right here. One of three. Those are our best achievements. <laughs> Okay, by far. So.